Hello, everyone. My name is Abby Perez, and I'm a third year PhD student in Cardiff and Boston's research group here at the University of Maryland in NIST. Today, I'll be talking about direct laser writing of polymer nanowire waveguides for single photon extraction from epitaxial quantum dots. <clears throat> so, I'll start by giving us an overview of a typical quantum dot system, which of course begins with the quantum dot itself. Quantum dots are atom-like systems embedded in semiconductor material, which at cold temperatures can produce quantum states of light, and that is why we're interested in, that is what we're interested in, these quantum states of light and being able to collect and utilize them. So quantum dots are usually accompanied by a two-dimensional electromagnetic structure that lives in the same plane of the semiconductor as the quantum dot. Together, these have become a well-investigated system for producing single photons. However, in order to collect these photons, there's a third component, which is usually an optical system consisting of a microscope, filters, polarizers, etc., that then guides or take the light and dump it into an optical fiber for use um, in the laboratory and so forth. So while these systems, the quantum dot and the structure and the electromagnetic structure are small enough that they can fit at the end of a human hair, the optical systems associated with them can be very large and bulky. So we'd like to simplify that. Our approach to doing this is using direct laser writing. Direct laser writing is a lithography method that tightly focuses a laser beam into a bright focal point that is within a photosensitive polymer. At this focal point, two of the lithography photons are absorbed by the polymer, thereby, and, and then it becomes cured. Then by dragging around the focal point within this three-dimensional uh, pool, you can create a three-dimensional structure of cured photoresist. This photoresist can then become any object you want it to be. So examples of this include creating freeform lenses for light coupling into and out of photonic chips, as well as uh, 3D micro-optic structures for the collection of light from quantum dots. And this is really what we want to focus in on here for the rest of this talk. So another example of this quantum dot micro-optic structures is a recent work by Bremer, where they basically take a quantum dot and let the light coming from it radiate freely, and then they use a total internal reflection lens to get this light collimated and then this collimated back, get this collimated light back down into a fiber. So this system works really well. It's very impressive work. However, this is still working with pretty much some emission that is expanding freely at first, and then it's also using a far field ray optics picture to engineer the devices and the systems. More or less, it's leaving the near field design space unexplored. So we think that there's some good opportunities here um, in the near field design space, and we're going to propose one of them. So instead of working with a miniaturized optical system, we're going to try to do a wavelength scale optical system that is fundamentally different from lenses. So what we're proposing is taking a slab of gallium arsenide that has a quantum dot embedded within it and taking the light that is radiating vertically from this quantum dot and immediately funneling it into a guided mode of a waveguide. This waveguide is what we're going to create using direct laser ray. So this waveguide should probably have or will have a diameter of approximately one micron, which means that its critical dimension is about 20 times smaller than, a, than that of a miniaturized lens. So this introduces, this lambda scale fabrication introduces many challenges, which is what we're going to go over during the rest of this talk. Uh, but it also provides the opportunity to work with guided waves, which are nice because then those can be redirected and moved around as needed, whether that be to other parts of the substrate or to, um, say, a fiber optic cable. In that case, there would be some mode field, con mode field uh, size conversion that takes place. But again, because we're working with guided modes, in principle, it should be easy. We'll be the first to say that this is still leaves the design space mostly unexplored. This is a simple first step in the in, in the direction of wavelength scale optical systems for quantum dot extraction using direct laser ray. <laughs> so if I superimpose this nanowire on top of this total internal reflection lens, you can see that it's much, much smaller. So we have some simulations that support the idea of using nanowires. And we start by having this silicon substrate. Um, we have silicon as a substrate, and then we have a layer of gold on top of that. And on top of that, we have a layer of gallium arsenide with quantum dots embedded in it. Finally, we have air above everything. So if we take such a system and simulate it using 3D FDTD, what we find is that gold does a good job of reflecting light from reflecting light and stopping it from leaking down into the substrate. And then the quantum dots and the gallium arsenide uh, do a good job of um, emitting. And some of this emitted light is going to radiate in the vertical direction. The light that does go in the vertical direction, however, as you can see, is unguided, uncontrolled, and freely expanding. What we're proposing is adding a polymer nanowire waveguide 
directly on top of this quantum bath. So as you can see from this simulation, doing so guides the light in, in, by immediately funneling it into a guided mode. And then this gives you the added flexibility of being able to move it around or change its mode of diameter. However, in real life, uh, it is very challenging to produce perfectly cylindrical nanowire waveguides. In reality, what we have found is that we have corrugations at the base of our cylinders. This is unfortunate, but thankfully, our simulations show that even with these corrugations, polymer nanowire waveguides are still effective at guiding light. In fact, focusing uh, here on this uh, corrugated nanowire, although this would also be true for the perfect case, if we take a cross section of the light going in the vertical direction, what we would have is this a very nice looking uh, Gaussian mode. In fact, for a diameter of 800 nanometers with 160 nanometer corrugations in the base, 90% of the light in the nanowire is in its fundamental mode, which is a very good number. Um, furthermore, this technique is fairly broadband, meaning that it could be applied just as easily to um, light at 780, light at 1550, and essentially it's not a cavity, so it's, it's fairly broadband. Um, as we have already stated, this in theory makes it possible to have direct fiber coupling. And one of my one of the most important things to me is that this additive fabrication process leaves the in-plane physics undisturbed. So it is able to coexist with any two-dimensional electromagnetic structures already in the plane of the quantum bath. Furthermore, the, the structures that we're proposing are small enough that they can later be removed fairly easily. So I'm going to go over a couple of the challenges associated with this lambda scale direct laser ion fabrication. And just as, to keep in mind, we're working on gallium arsenide and on gold, which are both reflective surfaces, but some of the issues that we go over would be true in other surfaces as well. Okay, so first of all, reflective substrates cause scanning waves. They also produce non-uniform exposure near the surface. Finally, or in addition, reflective and absorbing substrates may have poor heat dissipation. And finally, small structures are fragile. So the first of these, which is that, first we'll go over the fact that reflections cause scanning waves. So just to keep a picture in our head, we're going to try to print these narrow and long nanowires. And in our first few attempts at trying to do this, we frequently ran into the following issues. We would often see nanowires that were not standing, um, and they'd be on their side instead. But what was very interesting about this was that there was some sort of base that stuck around, even when the nanowires fell. Later, when we were able to, in fact, have nanowires that were standing, what we found is that this base, in fact, came from the nanowires. It just remained behind when the rest of the structure fell. And so it's also quite obvious that these uh, nanowires that are supposed to be cylindrical have very, very deep sidewall corrugations, and that these are probably due to standing weights. So if we measure the periodicity of these um, corrugations, we find that the periodicity is about 243 nanometers, um, which, uh, which agrees well with the theoretically predicted value of 253 nanometers for standing wave reflections. Now, this is an effect that has been seen in the literature, but, that, but we kind of take a different approach to solve it. So what we do is we add a wedge underneath our substrate so that it is now angle mounted. So when light, when the lithography beam hits the substrate, instead of reflecting right back up, it reflects at an angle. And we found that this is a really effective way of reducing the amplitude of the standing wave corrugations. In fact, we're able to bring them down to about 120 to 130 nanometers, which is something that we're really happy with. Um, as I showed in the previous slide, anything underneath 160 nanometers already has about 90% of the light in the fundamental mode. However, since we're now printing with the substrate at an angle, we have to put our nanowires at an angle in order to compensate for this shift. A couple of warnings is that angle mounting the substrate may lead to ob objective substrate collision. And furthermore, interface finding or focus finding becomes more challenging on a substrate that is at an angle than one that is flat. So next, uh, reflections cause uneven exposure intensities. So this is pretty easy to understand. If you're printing on gold and you're focusing a laser on its surface, Right at the surface is going to be a very high intensity field, and this high intensity field is going to expose a greater region of photoresist than one which is further away and has lower intensity. This causes a geometric distortion on the nanowires that decreases the, the diameter of the nanowire and makes it not constant over its length. So here's an example where we print that on gold and here's one on gallium arsenide. To mitigate this, what we did was separated the, the exposure into two segments. The bottom segment was printed with a lower power than the top segment. And we found that this does a good job of reducing this geometric distortion when we're printing on gold, which is once again what's happening here in this column. And when we're printing on gallium arsenide, which is what's happening on this column, we actually found it does a tremendous job at making this diameter nearly constant. In fact, for our application, this is more than constant enough. 
But if someone needed a very, very precise diameter, they could consider breaking this up into even more than two segments. Next, we discovered that heat dissipation is an issue when we print on gold and or again arsenide, <clears throat> as it probably is for many other surfaces. In particular, we found that when we were printing in nano, an array of nanowires uh, with increasing power, there would be some point at which the laser power would be too high and you would see bubbling or blistering, uh, otherwise known as you would damage your, your nanowire. Now, this is to be expected. What wasn't expected was that if you print a second array immediately after the first, the power level at which you induce damage to the nanowire actually decreases. And what's even more perplexing is that if you continue to produce uh, these nanowire arrays, the power level at which you induce damage actually decreases. So you are more and more likely to damage your nanowires. And that was confusing until we caught up on the literature and found that this effect has been, in fact, studied before. And if you have a glass substrate, what happens is the exit laser light, or you know, any laser light that's not absorbed by the photoresist, transmits through your substrate and exits the system. However, with metal substrates or with absorbing substrates, the heat remains in the vicinity, either absorbed or reflected, and this causes a heat dissipation issue, which then can cause distortion and or blistering or other deformations to your desired print. So in order to reduce this, what we did was added a five second delay between nanowires, meaning that we would print one, wait five seconds, print another, and so on and so forth. When we did this, had this, when we did introduce this delay, we found that we no longer had this issue of a um, of damage being in increasingly likely to occur the more time we broke the array. So what we found is that you know adding a five second delay was good enough to reduce this damage, and that in turn reduced increased our yield. So next we want to talk about how you develop fragile structures. Uh, once again, we already know that these are uh, long and skinny uh, nanowires, which is hard. So not only are they is it difficult to find the correct you know printing parameters. But even once you do have them and you have these long rigid structures, there are other uh, uh, ways that they can end up collapsing. So here, you, for example, you see rigid structures that are being pulled towards one another. What we found was, once again, in the literature is that this is an end effect. <clears throat> and what's happening is that your nanowires are experiencing a capillary force while they're being um, removed from their developer. So to try to mitigate this, there is an improved development process that has been reported in the past where you submerged your nanopillars in your developer, but instead of simply removing them from the developer when they are complete, you replace this dirty re developer with isopropyl alcohol. And once you have just a clean pool of isopropyl alcohol on top of your developed nanowires, you do an additional UV flood exposure of the nanowires, and this causes them to harden before they experience the capillary forces. Now, these hardened pillars are strong enough to withstand the forces. So, Following this development procedure and combining it with the previous techniques, we were able to produce very high aspect ratio nanowires that also had very high yield. As you can see in this field of 81 nanowires, we have one failure. So in summary, we were able to mitigate sandy waves by printing at an angle. We mitigated uneven exposure by separating the, by having two power levels. We mitigated heating issues by introducing a delay and we overcame structure fragility by having an additional UV exposure. By combining these techniques, we now have nanowires that stand straight, have small sidewall corrugations, have high yield, and have high aspect ratios. Here are specific printing parameters. It is also possible, however, to remove nanowires once you have printed them. And so I'll go over this very briefly. The idea here is that you want to do a two-step process, where first, while the sample is submerged in isopropyl alcohol, we use a Q-tip to release the large structures from the substrate, which is what we show here. And then we put our substrate in a 700 watt O2 plasma for two minutes. And this helps clean up the rest of the photoresist on the surface. And then doing so, we're able to effectively remove our nanowires from our valuable substrate. This is wonderful because if there's something wrong with your print, you have not ruined the in-plane devices. You can recycle this and do them until you either get things right or you're pleased with some person. If you skip this Q-tip, um, if you skip this Q-tipping step, what might happen is that when you place your sample in, in the O2 plasma, the O2 plasma might just cross into polymer and actually make it harder to remove. So we recommend um, finding a way to remove the bulk of the resist before putting it in the plasma. Finally, I just want to briefly go over some uh, optical data from, from these nanowires. So if you have a field of nanowires, which, is, which are these gray dots, and you focus a laser on the top of one of them, you get this very nice, tightly confined focal slot. However, in this exact same setup, if you simply displace yourself away from the top of one of these nanowires, 
what you see is a very large uh, region of uh, a very large bright spot of light. And so this is a very simple visual mechanism of seeing with an analog zooming. But basically, um, in, in the image on the top, the light is being guided into the mode of the fund of the being guided into the mode of the nanowire. And the bottom, there is no guided mode. And you, instead of having a tight spot of light, you have freely, um, freely, uh, you have a, a free expansion of light, and you get a bright spot on the subterranean. So, using the system like this above, we were able to interrogate some of the quantum dots living in this sample. And in fact, we do see quantum dot lights coming through the nanowire, which is very good. This is really what we wanted to see. And if we want to be able to say something about this uh, on average or statistically, what we have to do is check dozens of nanowires. So we do that. We say how many peaks exist above some threshold, which is 40% of the tallest peak. Um, so in this case, there would be one, two, uh, two peaks that exist above a certain count rate. And if we do this for dozens and dozens of nanowires, which are shown here in red, and dozens and dozens of locations off of nanowires, what we see is that if you are on a nanowire, you're actually likely to have a better extraction efficiency than if you're off of a nanowire. So what we have done is we have transferred the radiation from the quantum dot into a guided mode and increase its collection efficiency by 1.5 on average. This is really, really great news for us because now we have all the flexibility of guided modes and we've increased collection efficiency. So there's more work for us to do. For us to do, we would like to increase this efficiency and we would like to eventually cover a couple of these nanowires. And this is something that we're really excited about. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.